Good afternoon, friends. Uh, we are today going to discuss uh, perioperative management of diabetes. People are slowly uh, joining in, uh, so I shall uh, just go a little bit slow initially. So this uh, lecture is actually based on uh, the guidelines which were produced by Association of Anesthetists in 2015, uh, perioperative management of surgical patients with diabetes. And uh, also uh, from the Endocrine Society of US. And uh, the difference you will see that uh, between the slides, I go between using uh, milligram per deciliter and millimole uh, per liter. Uh, because both the, uh, you know, the UK uses millimoles and whereas uh, US and other places use uh, milligram per deciliter. But I'll also tell you how we will convert uh, millimoles into uh, milligrams. Um, we have to do it quite a few times uh, when we are looking at insulin requirements. So these uh, facts will actually deal with it. Uh, so first thing is, uh, wherever you see this uh, abbreviation CBG, it basically means capillary blood glucose. Because when you actually monitor blood glucose, it is actually from the capillary blood. You don't take it from big vein, it's from the capillaries. Whether you take a pinprick on the finger or you take it from the earlobe, it is uh, the capillary uh, blood glucose. So CBG here actually means uh, capillary blood glucose. Now, converting millimoles uh, per liter to milligram per deciliter, all you need to do is whatever is a millimoles, you multiply by 18. So if your uh, blood sugar measurement, capillary blood sugar manual glucose ma measurement is uh, 10 millimoles, that means it's equal to uh, 180 milligram per deciliter. Uh, so simple, uh, um, you know, multiplication. And uh, one unit of insulin uh, drops the blood glucose by approximately three millimoles, uh, which comes to around 50 milligrams per deciliter. It's 53 milligrams if we cover, but it's actually, yeah, it's uh, 54. Um, 18 threes, yeah, 54. So, but this drop is can be variable. That's not because uh, the insulin, it's because there are different kind of insulins. And also patients have various sensitivities. So uh, the drop can be anywhere between 30 to 100 milligrams. But on average, it's around 50 milligrams uh, per deciliter drop uh, with one unit of insulin. So if you, this is actually given in Miller and uh, uh, it's been there for a very long time. Uh, so it's a, a easy way of looking at uh, what would be the insulin requirement uh, per hour. Uh, so if you actually measure the capillary blood glucose and uh, you divide it by 150, now this has to be milligram per deciliter. So in in UK, uh, we use millimoles, so we'll have to convert it into to a milligram per deciliter. So we'll multiply by 18 and divided by 150 will give you the insulin requirement per hour. So if somebody has a blood glucose of 300 milligram per deciliter, we will require two units of insulin per hour. And if you look at it, it actually matches very easily because if we look at normal insulin, 150 uh, milligram per deciliter, you probably require one unit uh, per hour. But in a very stressful state, so patients who actually have infection or have chronic disease or been uh, hospitalized for a long time, then insulin requirement might be much higher. So uh, in that case, uh, whatever is the blood glucose levels, you divide by 100 then that becomes your requirement of insulin per hour. So if the same patient uh, was stressful, so we had blood sugar of 300 milligram per deciliter, and we divide 100, that means three units. So it requires extra one unit per hour of insulin. So that's a simple way of looking at it. And uh, there are some standards uh, set in. So this is from Diabetic UK. And they say that uh, HbA1c should be less than 69 millimoles per mole or 8.5% in previous three months for elective cases. That actually signifies that uh, the blood sh uh, sugars have been well controlled. So this is about how they control. 
uh, of uh, blood sugar is over a long period of time because you could actually have a normal blood sugar this morning uh, but it may have been uh, varying through the day so it gives you overall uh, picture of how the blood sugar control has been uh, over the months and this is a easy table and i can actually put it up uh, for you guys i will uh, take a snapshot and create a slide or a picture of this and you can use it so this actually gives you uh, hba1c in percent millimole per mole as well as what it relates to average blood glucose so for example if somebody actually has a hba1c of seven that's what we're talking about probably seven or eight and uh, then uh, say it is eight uh, percent that is equivalent to 64 millimole per mole and uh, that equates to the average blood glucose of 10 millimole per liter and that's around 180 milligram per deciliter so you need to be actually much lower than that so you need to be between uh, six and seven uh, um, you know uh, six or seven six point nine percent or seven percent uh, of that where the blood sugar would actually the average blood sugar be around eight millimoles per liter so the whole idea of uh, blood sugar control is to actually ensure normal glycemia whether it is uh, a patient coming to theater or a person diabetic patient who is visiting a clinic uh, our aim is to maintain the uh, capillary blood glucose between six to ten millimoles per liter and the endocrine society actually says that it need to be 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter because uh, six uh, actually correlates to 100 but uh, uh, and 10 does uh, because 10 millimoles into 18 is 180 milli, uh, uh, milligram per deciliter uh, but uh, they actually say that the blood sugar good blood sugar control is at around 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter that is what is considered as normal glycemia so that's be will be our targets so endocrine society in 2012 actually had a a, a nice uh, you know uh, review and uh, they actually uh, Give, give some nice statements uh, which are very useful uh, for diabetic control uh, for perioperative period. So they also said that among the non-diabetics, patients who are older, male, with higher uh, body mass index, uh, probably like me, and higher ASA physical status are more likely to have hyperglycemia. Right? So this is non-diabetic patients. So if you were to monitor the blood sugar uh, in a patient uh, like me, uh, uh, then you are very likely to actually see hyperglycemia uh, intraoperatively. They have also said that uh, capillary, uh, capillary blood glucose testing uh, uh, should be done in all patients on admission to the hospital, regardless whether uh, they are diabetic or not. And a further monitoring uh, of these patients that is non-diabetic patient admitted who have blood sugar uh, more than 140 milligram per deciliter uh, should be done for 24 to 48 hours and uh, if it actually starts going up higher up then you might actually have to start them on treatment then uh, about uh, hba1c uh, testing for inpatients uh, non-diabetics uh, who have uh, the capillary blood sugar of more than 140 milligrams and all diabetics uh, if it has not been done in the last two or three months uh, prior to the admission uh, then hba1c testing should be done that would actually tell us how the uh, blood sugar control has been over the months so does having a good control of blood sugar have anything to do with uh, good outcomes or in uh, conversely if the blood sugar is not well uh, controlled, does it actually lead to uh, a bad outcomes? Let's have a look at what the literature has said. So it is uh, a few of the uh, reviews. These are mentioned in the uh, review uh, by the Endocrine Society. And uh, they say that if the HPA1C is less than seven, then the infectious complications are much less in patients. They do not talk about any other outcomes. Other outcomes were not actually mentioned. And if the HbA1c is more than 11.5, then there is increased chances of infectious complications. So high blood sugars are associated with high infections. 
And this is, theme is repeated in other publications as well. And looking at the capillary blood glucose levels, they've said that if the blood sugar are 200 milligram per deciliter or more, then there's twofold increased risk in overall mortality. So they talk about death now here. And fourfold increased cardiovascular mortality and pulmonary embolism risk. So hyperosmolarity uh, can obviously lead to uh, clot formation or DVT. So, uh, so there could be a cardiovascular risk and a pulmonary uh, embolism risk, which can obviously also lead to uh, death. If you look at a lower uh, level, so the half of that, so if you look at uh, blood sugars more than just 100 milligrams per deciliter, and they say there could be a longer hospital stay and increased mortality. Yes. So 100 milligrams per deciliter is not a very high thing. And uh, we also know that uh, now we are no longer looking at uh, very tight controls. So that was in vogue uh, in the early 2000s. And uh, uh, where a study had actually shown that, oh, just by controlling or making, uh, keeping the blood sugars in tight control reduces the mortality, that was uh, proven wrong over the years. So we no longer actually go for tight control. Tight control is, a, is an old thing. Now, why do patients actually who are diabetic have higher risk of infection? And this was seen uh, that if the blood sugars on the higher side, then it is associated with increased production and impaired scavenging of uh, reactive oxygen species, or ROS. ROS is actually required for uh, you know, taking care of all the uh, uh, bad stuff which is produced uh, during a uh, patient being sick or uh, in case of infection. And uh, also uh, the uh, polymorph nuclear uh, neutrophils, they are, the dysfunction is increased. And because of their dysfunction, they're not able to uh, you know, uh, eat away the bacteria, uh, the phages, that's why called phages. And uh, this uh, lead to decreased intracellular uh, killing of the uh, bacteria. And obviously this leads to poor wound healing and increased uh, infection risk. So having high blood sugars is not good, uh, good for a post-operative patient. And it's a vicious cycle, right? So if you have chronic infection and you are in urgent or semi-urgent surgery, and that itself leads to poor control of blood sugar. And uh, if their blood sugar are poorly controlled, then it gets infection. So it's a vicious risk. And that's why it's very, very important uh, that uh, we should actually have a good control of blood sugar. Not a very tight control, uh, but blood sugars of uh, uh, 140 to 180 milligram per deciliters. So what are the goals of uh, managing perioperative diabetes? Uh, so we're very simple. Uh, if possible, the case should be done first thing in the morning. And we will say why uh, we need to do that. We also need to actually have a plan of managing uh, if the blood sugars are going very high or the patient is dropping the blood sugar. So basically plan for managing hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, both uh, should be in place. And we should actually have facility to uh, also start patients on variable rate intravenous uh, insulin infusion, or VRIII, okay. And uh, this is necessary if a patient uh, who will miss more than one meal, uh, so patient has been fasted uh, for a long time, so this is diabetic patient fast for a long time. A diabetic, uh, I mean type one diabetic uh, who has no background insulin infusion, or insulin requirements uh, or uh, is not on a pump. A patient who is poorly controlled diabetic, like we said, patients who have HbA1c more than 69 millimoles uh, per mole. And all the diabetics who are going to require emergency surgery. Like I said before, a patient who is under stress, emergency surgery has a great stress on the body and they require a greater amount of insulin. So coming to the diabetic patient. Now you can actually get patients uh, who are on insulin and they could be just on oral hyperglycemic type 2 diabetic or they can even be on co combination of both. So when it comes to the oral hyperglycemic agents and uh, the uh, nurses on the ward or your uh, surgical colleague ask, they say, oh, this patient is on this oral hyperglycemic. What are we going to do? Do we stop? Do we wait? Do we let say, okay, have let go. 
Right, so there are various uh, different groups of uh, oral hypoglycemic agents. We have sulfonylureas, we have bigonides, uh, we have glucosidase inhibitors, uh, we have glitazones, we have incretin analogs, and uh, that is an, uh, uh, incretin uh, analogs are the uh, what you call uh, GIP uh, inhibitors. Um, so now the all this uh, different you know, kind of uh, the oral hypoglycemic, what do we do about them? And not every oral hypoglycemic need to be stopped. And which one need to be stopped and which, which can it continue? I'll discuss that now. Okay. So if you look at agents uh, which uh, uh, basically act by lowering glucose concentration, so basically they are actually increasing sensitivity to insulin. So they are uh, uh, side of... Uh, uh, improving insulin uh, output. And uh, these are sulfonylureas, uh, uh, uh obviously insulin itself, and to some extent, uh, uh, thiazolidinodines, even I can't even pronounce that properly. <laughs> okay, so uh, these uh, ones, so because they sensitize the cells to insulin, uh, their dose need to be modified, or you might actually have to stop them. But there are other agents, and uh, this is only just showing the uh, other ones uh, talking about like ingredients, which are uh, GLP-1 and GIP uh, kind of uh, analogs. So uh, they actually reduce the blood sugar by stimulating insulin secretion or by inhibiting glucagon release. And uh, so these need to be stopped. Whereas there are other oral hypoglycemic agents uh, which uh, basically prevent uh, the uh, rise in the uh, glucose levels. Uh, so, for example, you have metformin or uh, you have a GLP-1, which is like gluco, uh, glucogon-like uh, peptide 1 analog. And uh, you have di dipeptidyl uh, peptidase 4 inhibitors, uh, which I clear, uh, showed it in the in the other slide, this slide. If you look at it, that uh, shows how they actually work. Um, uh, so, these drugs, uh, because they actually help to prevent the glucose levels to rise. So they prevent hyperglycemia. So these kind of drugs may be continued without risk. And again, I will actually go into details of uh, how uh, we need to actually uh, alter them. So the drugs that require omission. So we look at this and so uh, we got uh, the drugs on the left side. So you got the, uh, the repaglinide, nediglinide, uh, which are uh, megalitinates. And you have sulfonylureas, and uh, these are common. You, you see sulfonylureas is quite common. Patients on being on that. Uh, Glycosylide is actually a, a very common drug used. So on the day before admission, uh, if they're eating and they're fine, they actually continue with the drug. Now, if the surgery is in the uh, in the morning, then you actually omit it, right? Now, surgery in the uh, afternoon, you can actually give a morning dose if the patient is eating, but Try to omit them if they are actually still, still still fasting. And if these patients are going to be started on VRRI, so for example, these patients got admitted, they are taking oral hyperglycemics, uh, but when the uh, blood sugar was done in the ward, uh, the blood sugars were on the higher side, so they were started on variable uh, rate uh, intravenous insulin infusion. In that case, you stop uh, these drugs and uh, till the patients start eating and drinking normally. Then another uh, group of drugs uh, which need to be uh, uh, you know, omitted uh, uh, because uh, fasting can uh, increase the risk of ketoacidosis. Uh, this is uh, sodium uh, glucose transporters, uh, and the two inhibitors. And these are the uh, lepaglifosine and canaglifosine. And so Again, a day before surgery, patient is eating, so no need to change that. But on the surgery, if it's in the morning, uh, obviously omit it. Uh, surgery in the afternoon, if they have been asked, patients have been out to take breakfast, that's fine, but otherwise stop it. Uh, again, if the patient is on VRRI, then, then you stop it. So very simple with these drugs. Now the drugs that may be continued. Now, like I said, there are some drugs which act to reduce the amount of blood glucose uh, in the circulation. And these are like uh, uh, carbos and uh, DPP-4 inhibitors. Uh, this is the gliptins, acetagliptin, 
uh, ritagliptin, sexagliptin, nephrogliptin. So these these gliptins, uh, they not only take it as normal, even if the day of surgery, uh, before the surgery, yes, and morning of surgery, yes, and even if the surgery is in the in the afternoon, they can still continue taking them. Okay. Uh, but if these patients are actually started now, if they have high uh, blood sugar and they start on VRI, it's better to stop it. Okay, till they start eating and drinking. Uh, I have I have noticed this uh, very commonly. Uh, sometimes even uh, if the patients, uh, you know, uh, without actually thinking, you will see on the wards, patient have been started on uh, this VRI because it's fashionable. And they started, and these patients actually drop their blood sugar very drastically as soon as insulin is started. So you need to be, uh, be careful if the patient go on a VRI. Okay. So if these patients go on VRI, so I think simple rule is if the patients are going to go on VRI, irrespective of what kind of oral hypoglycemic they are going to be, uh, just stop those uh, oral hypoglycemic. Do not uh, allow them to take them. Like there are newer uh, kind of uh, the other ones like uh, the, the glucuron, like uh, the peptidase, the GLP1 uh, analogs uh, and uh, metformin. And uh, these you can be taken. Uh, there was some controversy about metformin, uh, saying that oh, the metformin can cause lactic acidosis and patient fasting, and that has been now actually discredited. They said no, there's no harm. If the patient has taken their metformin, there's no problem at all. Uh, they can uh, actually take it as normal the day for surgery. They can as normal uh, if they are actually, uh, you know, surgery in the morning or in the afternoon, they're getting as normal, right? And the what is interesting about uh, the GLP-1 analogs is that they say that uh, you can actually take them as normal even if they are on VRI. So this is the only only one uh, group of drugs uh, which uh, a patient can still take if they are started on VRI. So the only thing we have to be careful metformin is that because it is excreted uh, by the kidneys, uh, if the patient is actually have a low EGFR and uh, that is less than 60, and then I think uh, it's better to to stop that. Or a patient has any amount of renal dysfunction, or you are going to use a lot of contrast. For example, patient is having a interventional procedure like endovascular repair. It's better to stop them. So, in in brief, I think uh, if you look at it, if the patient is going to be started on VRI, uh, just stop stop the drugs and. Uh, don't worry because the patient can actually drop the blood sugar drastically if they are on insulin. The glitter zones, uh, again, uh, they can be taken as normal, uh, but if you are starting a VRI, uh, stop them as well. So coming to insulin, obviously uh, patients uh, can be on insulin uh, if they are type 1 diabetic and they're not producing any insulin at all, that's why they are, but also the patients who are type 2 diabetic Diabetes, have type 2 diabetes, they can also be on insulin, start on insulin if their blood glucose uh, control has been very, very poor. And there are actually, obviously, uh, various uh, kind of uh, insulins, and uh, you have uh, a rapid uh, acting insulin, you have intermediate ones, you have long acting ones, and patient can be on mixture of both. So they can be, a long act, be on long acting one, uh, especially at night, and they can be on uh, the or, you know, rapid acting ones or intermediate acting ones, which they take before their meals. So uh, if they're taking their meals, uh, uh, they need to reduce the dose by 20% uh, the day before surgery. And uh, on the morning of surgery, we check the blood glucose, right? And uh, again, depending on what the blood sugars are, uh, we would actually uh, start them on uh, the variable rate insulin and how it is started, I will actually uh, go through that as well. So there's again uh, other other kinds of ins insulin. Um, so it's it said that because the patient would be fasting for a longer period of time, uh, you need to make sure uh, that uh, the patient uh, uh, would require a lesser lesser amount of dose. So like for example, the biphasic one or ultra long acting one. Uh, the morning of surgery, uh, we need to actually half the usual dose and check the blood sugar. 
But simple rule is if the patient is not taking anything, not eating, and there's no point in actually giving uh, patients insulin. So there is a lot uh, about uh, how the uh, dose calculations are done uh, for insulin. A uh, little bit uh, uh, can be confusing, uh, but we'll follow the simple rule that if the patient is fasting, you do not, uh, patient is not taking orally, they do not get insulin. It's a simple, simple rule and uh, nothing uh, very complex. So uh, coming to available rate insulin infusions. Um, and uh, so we have already uh, discussed this uh, previously, but this is again uh, stressing uh, who are the patients who would need to be started on variable rate uh, insulin infusions. So patient who will miss more than uh, one meal. These are diabetics uh, who will miss more than one meal. Uh, type 1 diabetics, obviously, uh, because they are on insulin. So we need to start them on that. And also uh, patients who are very poorly controlled. Uh, so they, these patients might be on oral hypoglycemic or insulin. They invariably will go on, on a, a variable rate insulin. And patients uh, who require emergency surgery, that is diabetic patients who require emergency surgery, uh, they're under great stress and they would require that. So starting a variable rate insulin is not a simple thing. Uh, you need uh, uh, monitoring. So you need to be able to monitor the blood sugar, you need to have a a reliable blood sugar me measurements, uh, which can be done by bedside, uh, which are calibrated uh, regularly, and uh, they give you right reading. You can always calibrate them uh, uh, by putting the uh, sample into the blood gas machine or sending a sample uh, to the lab, uh, but they usually actually come with caloric, uh, their own indicators uh, they have uh, you know, for testing every day. And uh, they need to be, um, uh, you know, this need to administration and monitoring need to be done by qualified people who have been trained. So interoperative care and monitoring. Uh, so we know the aim. So obviously, aim is to maintain a good glycemic control, uh, blood sugar of around six to ten millimoles or one hundred and forty to uh, one hundred and eighty milligram per deciliter. At the same time, we also know insulin leads to uh, the potassium being pushed into the cell, so hypokalemia can occur with dextrose insulin, so we need to do that. Also, because we're using dextrose along with insulin, we also know that sodium can drop because all you left is, is with water, which uh, dilutes the electrolytes. So normal electrolyte concentration measurement is also important. At the same time, it's also important that cardiovascular uh, stability is maintained and renal perfusion is maintained and, uh, and during this period. Also important is that we have seen that patients who, who are uh, you know diabetic uh, we know that stress uh, whether it's uh, surgical stress or stress from pain uh, so use of multimodal analgesia i mean i stress it all the time it's very very important uh, patients getting approved whether you're using epidural centenial axis blocks uh, or using peripheral nerve blocks that's very very important it's also important that the patient uh, anti-sickness medicines are, are administered uh, during the procedure, so at the beginning and at the end. Uh, that is because this patient, if they're going to vomit, they are going to become dehydrated, and uh, they this will likely uh, cause an imbalance uh, in their electrolytes, so that's not very good. And the main aim is to actually be able to get the patient to a normal diet. So if the patient has been, you know, been sick in the post-op, you can't get them back to the diet. And if you can't get back them to the normal diet, you cannot get them back on the normal oral hypoglycemic or normal insulin. So uh, the aim is basically to uh, make sure that they are able to eat and drink soon after the operation and able to go back on their normal diabetic uh, regimen. So interoperative management of diabetic, and like I said, the uh, targets are 6 to 10 millimoles per liter or 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter. But in certain cases, we can allow a higher limit. We can go up to 12 millimoles per liter. And this is done uh, basically where the patient has poorly controlled diabetic. Now, if you actually get a patient, say, for example, uh, you go patient with diabetic foot who's uh, uh, got uh, this uh, horrible uh, infection in the leg, and oh, how hard do you try to control the blood sugar, it's going to be a problem, right? Because here you need to actually, like I said, it's a vicious cycle. You actually get uh, infection, patient is in stress, require more insulin, and uh, as the hyperglycemia also causes more infection to the, so you can't just postpone the case and say, no, no, we're not getting a good blood pressure. You need to get the patient in, 
control the infection, and then uh, you know you will get a better control. So in certain cases, you have to have to allow for a higher uh, limit. And as I mentioned, you need to actually have uh, uh, you know this machine bedside machine or bedside monitoring uh, for uh, blood glucose, and they need to be accurate. They need to be regularly uh, you know checked because when you have patient on insulin infusion and uh, the blood sugars can uh, be very variable and you need to monitor them hourly and uh, you might even have to do it more frequently if the blood sugars are actually going very high so uh, a good machine is very very important and um, uh, for the wards we normally have charts but in the theaters we're going to ma uh, uh, maintain uh, the blood sugar written on the anesthesia charts so how do we set up a VRI? So this is this is uh, the uh, important bit. So obviously you need an infusion pump, and uh, we also need a volumetric pump because we are not going to give the insulin through a syringe driver, whereas we are also going to give glucose along with it uh, through a infusion, a volumetric pump. So that need to be sort of accurate. Uh, uh, so we need both of these. Uh, obviously, need fluids as well. Do you uh, require dextrose insulin with uh, potassium uh, chloride? And you might also need to give additional fluid. There's two simple rules. Uh, one thing is that if you actually have type 1 diabetes who's on insulin, and especially who are actually having a background insulin, they you do not stop their insulin at any, any stage because this can precipitate the diabetic ketoacidosis then you can actually stop them but that means they need to be very hypoglycemic you're looking at the blood sugars going now to around uh, maybe uh, four four millimoles or three millimoles uh, we have seen that happen uh, but that is always a, a error where the volumetric infusion have been stopped uh, whereas the syringe pumps have been going going on. And uh, it's obviously important that uh, we don't run insulin on their own. Never, never, ever run that because this is ca can cause fatal hypoglycemia. And like I said, this normally happens where the accidentally uh, the uh, uh, glucose uh, infusion has been switched off, uh, whereas they forgot to switch off the uh, syringe pump. So... Uh, both need to be switched off uh, when the patient are being transported or uh, you're not going to uh, do that. But, but try, at the, at the most, try not to do that. So setting it up. So this is this is first thing is the prescription. You need to actually have prescription uh, both for the IV insulin as well as pres prescription for IV glucose. This is part of the chart. And this is the uh, thing which you'll, I will discuss separately. I'll put it down. So this is part of our chart, how it is done. So insulin and glucose, you will need a rapid or hemolin uh, S. Okay, so um, uh, this is this is the uh, uh, insulin you require, and you need to make a, in, a take a 50 ml syringe or 60 ml syringe in which you are going to add 50 units and make it up to one unit per hour. At the same time, you need a 500 ml bag of 10% dextrose along with 10 millimoles of KCL. Okay, so the KCL need to be omitted, obviously, if the patient's uh, potassium is uh, uh, greater than 5. Uh, but if it is actually less than that, then we actually add 20 millimoles of KCL. And if it is less than actually 3.5, we add, instead of 20 millimoles, we have uh, 40 millimoles of uh, KCL in it. And you run it around 40 mLs per hour. And it's important that both the insulin and uh, glucose are running in the same uh, kind of through the same cannula. So whether you actually have an octopus attached to it or you have a three-way tap or whatever, they need to be running in the same cannula. And this is important because if the cannula, uh, you know, become non-functional or is not, then both the things stop. Okay. Whereas if you actually have them in two different ones, if the glucose infusion stops. And, and insulin is running, you couldn't get hypoglycemia or other way around. And it's very important that the patients actually have two bags of 10% dextrose water always prescribed. Okay. They need to monitor the uh, the capillary blood glucose hourly, and they need to actually change uh, the uh, bags or insulin uh, rates, uh, not the bag, the insulin rate according to the blood sugar and how it is done. Then again, I will tell you how it is. Uh, what 
uh, protocols are followed for that. And insulin uh, need to be changed every 24 hours. And there was another important thing which I did not mention is that when you actually have an insulin, you need to flush the, uh, you know, insulin because insulin it does actually, uh, you know, stick to the plastic. So you need to, to discard certain initial amount. Uh, but with the syringe driver, the uh, you know dead space of this of the uh, tubings are very small. It's only around probably one ml to two ml. So just flush first initial one or two ml uh, before you start insulin with it. Okay. And then uh, you also need to monitor sodium and potassium because, like I said, uh, if when dextrose is metabolized, it's all it leaves in the body is water. So free water is there, dilutes the sodium. And uh, uh, the insulin we know is drives the potassium uh, into the cells by increasing the activity of sodium potassium adipase. Uh, so you can get hypokalemia, you can get hyponatremia, and the patient might actually require additional potassium and sodium. Uh, so you need to check UNEs uh, at least 24 hours. And if the potassium actually is going below 3.5, you might actually have to do it uh, more regularly, uh, maybe two or three times a, a day. And so if the surgery you did very well, the surgery went very well, diabetic control was good, and now your patient has gone back to the ward and you want to switch over to patient's uh, normal subcutaneous uh, insulin, in that case, it's important that the insulin uh, infusion is continued for 30 minutes after they get their subcutaneous uh, injection. And this was what the quiz was about, okay? It takes 30 minutes uh, for the, uh, you know, the IV insulin to peak, but it can take at least two to, two to three hours uh, for subcute injection of insulin to peak, right? So that's why it's very important that at least carry on the insulin for 30 minutes. Uh, uh, you know, so there's an overlap uh, between the subcut uh, injection and the insulin uh, dosing. So this is there. So in the middle, we have the target. That's our target, 5 to 12. Uh, actually, the target uh, here is a little bit more liberal, uh, but it is usually 6 to 10 millimoles. Uh, so if the target is 6 to 10, then you continue insulin at one unit per hour. If the insulin, uh, or the, sorry, the blood sugar goes about 12 and it's not going down, then you increase the rate by one unit per hour. So if the patient was getting one unit, then you actually increase by one. You And if it, the blood sugar has been actually on the higher side, for example, it was at uh, 20, then you increase by two, then monitor the blood sugar again at half an hour, okay, and then increases further. So you might actually have to do instead of hourly monitoring, uh, more uh, frequent monitoring and increase insulin. But if the blood sugar drops to less than five, then you need to decrease the insulin rate uh, to by one. That is not, I'm not saying it doesn't go to zero. You need to maintain it at 0.5 units per hour. But if say the patient was on two units per hour, then you drop it to one unit per hour. So I think this this is very, very simple uh, one. And, and this goes because we actually have moved away from tight control of blood sugars. And management of interop hyperglycemia or hyperglycemia is very, very simple. Uh, I've already talked about how hyperglycemia, and uh, sorry, about how the insulin things should be maintained. But if the blood sugars are actually remaining more than 12, uh, you need to not only uh, do the, uh, you know, capillary blood sugar, glucose, you also need to look at the urinary ketones. And if the capillary ketones are more than three millimoles or sorry, the capillary uh, blood ketones are more than three millimoles per liter or the urinary ketones are two plus, then you need to start thinking, is the patient uh, becoming uh, going into diabetic ketoacidosis? And uh, there are three things which we look at, the ketones more than three, uh, CBA, that is the capillary blood sugars, more than 11 and pH of less than 7.5 or bicarb of less than 15. So you need to better do a, a blood gas, uh, find out if the patient is becoming acidotic, uh, what are the bicarbs uh, levels, and also send the samples for uh, capillary ketone or the blood ketones, and also take a sample of urinary ketones. And if the blood sugar and ketones are, are positive, you might actually need to, if the patient is already on uh, the variable insulin, you might actually obviously have to increase the amount of insulin. And uh, if the patient has not bought insulin, you might want to actually give the patient subcute insulin, all right? 
and uh, you give two doses of subcutaneous insulin, right? And you actually wait, and if that doesn't still, you know, this is this is around one hour apart, and they still doesn't actually bring down the blood sugar, then you will have to start this patient on an insulin uh, infusion. So this is talking about a patient who was not on insulin infusion, but now showing blood high blood sugars and ketone positive. Okay. So ultimately, think the patient will be started on that. Yeah. So. This I have actually discussed probably before. Uh, the drop in uh, the blood sugar with one unit of insulin is around three millimoles, uh, which is approximately 50 milligrams per deciliter. But this can be anywhere from, uh, you know, 30 to 100 milligrams per deciliter, depending on the sensitivity of the patient. And as far as uh, the uh, subcut insulin is uh, considered, uh, you need to actually give them using specific insulin syringes. And uh, you need to actually check the blood sugar hourly and uh, and second dose consider only after two hours. Okay, so um, this is, I think I said one hour, so it should be two hours. So we're saying that two, uh, when the blood sugars are on the higher side, you do uh, give one uh, injection, subcut injection insulin, uh, monitor the blood sugar, uh, it's still high, then uh, this, is, this is up two hours, second dose, then monitor blood sugar again after the, that, and if they still remain, then they go on insulin infusion. So in hyperglycemia in uh, type two diabetes, these patients are not on uh, insulin, and so you can actually use uh, subcut uh, rapidly acting insulin, zero point one unit per kg, and maximum to six units. And uh, again, uh, check the blood sugars two hourly, and repeat the second dose only after two hours. And repeat, if the patient uh, blood sugar still remain high, then you start them on insulin infusions. So this is for patients who are uh, not on insulin and uh, are uh, still hyperglycemic. Hyperglycemia, obviously, uh, if the patient's uh, blood sugars are between four to six millimoles, uh, then uh, you can give them 50%, uh, sorry, 50 mLs or 20% uh, dexos water, that 10 grams. But if it starts going to less than four, then you might need to actually give uh, double the dose, 100 milligrams, sorry, 100 mLs so or 20% dextrose. You can also find 50% dextrose in the theaters, but problem with 50% dextrose is really hyperosmolar. And uh, that should only be uh, used uh, if you actually have a central line or, or it is actually uh, really serious uh, drop in blood sugar. We're looking at a blood sugar patient's drop is almost immeasurable or gone to two or three millimoles per liter. So but otherwise, 20% dextrose is fine. You can find 20% dextrose uh, very easily. 50% comes in a, in a while, in a, in a 50 ml vials. Okay. As far as fluid management concern, Hartman solution is considered to be a standard. Uh, the potassium in uh, the Hartman's is very small. Uh, which can be taken care of by the, uh, uh, you know, uh, your uh, excretion, urinary excretion. And uh, so uh, the fluids in uh, the where I we use glucose, and that is very important because the glucose is a substrate and it prevents uh, proteolysis, lipolysis, and ketogenesis. So it's important to preventing these. And uh, it's also very important to monitor the intravascular volume status. Just because the patient is getting that dextrose water, which is 40 ml per hour, which is probably not enough if you're having abdominal surgery, and a patient is losing a lot more, but you need to separately in, uh, also infuse patient with the Hartman solution or normal saline with potassium or whatever is uh, your electrolyte showing. Okay, So we need to maintain not only the volume, but also plasma electrolytes. Okay. And uh, like I said, 5% uh, dextrose, uh, the dex, dextrose, sorry, 10% dextrose we're using, dextrose getting metabolized, uh, so you can have hyponatremia, so make sure uh, sodium is also supplemented. Potassium, I have already may, uh, uh, mentioned that it will depend on uh, what the levels are. If the potassium is less than 3.5, you need to actually add 40 millimoles into that uh, 500 ml bag. And if it is uh, between 3.5 to 5, then 20 millimoles is more than enough. And the usual maintenance requirement is around 25 to 50 ml per kg per day. Uh, so a 70 kg man would actually require 80 ml per hour of the infusion. 
of which 40% is coming from the dextrose. Uh, red can, rest of it can come from Hartman's or from the normal saline. But don't forget the uh, inner losses which occur according to the surgery. You have to have another drip uh, running with uh, fluids. Sodium, uh, again, uh, I have to keep uh, stressing upon it that uh, dextrose uh, can cause a uh, drop in sodium. And especially in the elderly or patients who have been on uh, diuretics, uh, be careful. We can actually have patients going into severe hyponatremia as well. Intravascular volume, uh, balanced oil solution uh, remain the fluid of choice. Uh, so Hartman's, uh, uh, all of us actually use Hartman's or Ringel lactate uh, for most of these patients. So if the patient is uh, uh, a diabetic and uh, the blood sugars were not high in the ward and they do not require uh, the you know, uh, VRI because the blood sugars are between 6 to 8 or 6 to 10, in that case, it's very, very simple. You just avoid uh, glucose-containing solutions and uh, avoid uh, uh, hyperchloric metabolic acidosis. So saline is probably not the best solution uh, at that time. Uh, so uh, Hartman, again, is the uh, answer to the fluids here. So this is looking at uh, setups, uh, you know, where you have got uh, syringe pumps, you have got uh, volumetric pumps. But what about uh, places where there is no facility to it? You get diabetic patients in the rural areas, rural centers. You can get uh, diabetics in uh, small, uh, you know, uh, nursing homes, uh, which may not actually have facility for infusion and uh, for uh, volumetric pump. What do we do in that case? And there comes this uh, Velour regimen. Okay. A, a, such a simple idea uh, of managing diabetics. So as long as you have facility to monitor blood glucose and give fluids, you can use this uh, wonderful regimen from Velour in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu in India. Uh, these people uh, published this in Anesthesia Analogies. Yeah, this is a paper. So what we need is uh, they use not 10%, but use a 5% dextrose water and use a pediatric burette. You fill this burette to 100 ml, uh, saying that before that, uh, you need to actually just fill it with 20 ml and add some insulin and run it because, like I said, uh, the insulin get uh, in a stuck to the plastic. So uh, you don't want to do that. So the first take uh, around 20 ml, add some insulin to it, let it run through and then you fill it up with 100 ml and then you actually add the insulin to it and let the 100 ml go over an hour very easy to do isn't it so this is the simplest thing uh, to do now coming to it how much insulin do we add to this okay so here the idea is uh, to maintain the insulin between 100 to 150 and you add one insulin uh, one unit of insulin so it is this, this is what we're looking at. Okay, that door. So, so we add one unit of insulin to that and uh, we run it uh, for an hour, after an hour. This is labor intensive, but I think in the poor countries, we may not have resources, but what we do have is, is we actually have manpower. So it's, it's uh, manpower intensive. And uh, uh, every hour the drip has to be changed, the volumetric, uh, you know, sorry, the burette has to be uh, refilled and blood sugar to be to be managed, but it, this actually works. So after, after an hour, we found that the blood sugar was 200. In that case, what do you do? In that case, you add three units. Okay, so we already had one unit, but it didn't do anything. Blood sugar uh, now jumped by two levels. And so we add uh, two units to that okay so it's simple that we add one unit of insulin for every one to 50 milligram per deciliter uh, more than 100 milligram per deciliter of blood glucose levels all right and what also you say that when your blood sugars are going about 300 you also need to add 100 ml per of normal saline 
And this is because at this level, it's possible that the patient likely can actually have ketones as well. So they might be going to a diabetic ketosis and volume is very, very important. Okay. So just don't rely on that 100 ml of dextrose water. Okay. You also actually add, add 100 ml per hour of normal saline as well. So very uh, simple uh, method of, uh, you know, managing diabetes uh, in a rural setup or in a low resource center. So what happens now where the patient, the surgery is done, uh, everything is there, returning to normal medications. It's important that the communication uh, with the ward and staff is very clear and they're clear documentation. Like I said, if the patient has been on infusion and uh, you need to actually tell them once the patient uh, takes his subcut insulin, eats his food, that is only to be started once the patient has been taking normal amount of food, then you give uh, the subcut dose and continue the insulin for first half an hour and then you can stop it. So that is need to be communicated very clearly with the staff who are going to look after this patient. It need to be clearly documented in the notes that what is the plan is, right? It's also important that this decision making, uh, the patient need to be involved as well. So at the pre-op level, uh, before the surgery, you need to actually discuss this with the patient. They say, this is how I'm going to manage your diabetes, okay? I'm going to start you on insulin in the ward, uh, or I might have to have to start your insulin infusion in the theater operation theater, this is how, how often I'm going to, uh, you know, do your blood sugars. And when you come back to the ward, when do you need to actually start eating? When do you need to go down subcutaneous insulin? And what will happen to insulin? So the patient is involved. The patient can even guide the nurses, you know, even the nurses might forget. So they can uh, guide the patient. So involving the patient in the diabetic care is very important. A lot of these patients actually have read quite a bit about their diabetic control. I'm not saying that everybody is very aware, uh, but especially the patients who actually go on insulin, they are pretty educated about uh, their diabetic control. They monitor their own blood sugars as well. And it's so very important that uh, some of the patients who have been on uh, just oral hypoglycemic, they might actually require uh, insulin in the post-operative period. They have been through a very stressful surgery, or it might be a surgery where uh, the uh, you know the pancreas have been taken off or part of pancreas is taken off, like pancreatectomy or the patient actually had a condition which actually led to not much stress. So they can actually tip over and they require insulin. Or there is a requirement for dose alteration. So we have to look at that patient is not actually having his normal full meals, is not having a full diet. Do we actually reduce the insulin by 80%? Do we reduce by... 70% uh, or go down to 70% or go down to 80%, that need to be decided by a specific diabetic team or diabetic consultants along with the nurse team or uh, specialist nurses. So involve the uh, specialist nurses uh, when uh, you need to be manage the diabetes. So uh, coming uh, to the end of the lecture, and uh, I think uh, we have gone through uh, quite a lot of this. Uh, it's been a, almost an hour lecture. Uh, and uh, if there are any doubts or you want any of the slides uh, to be uh, put for your, you know, further thing, we can actually put it on the on the uh, group. Uh, so uh, let me know about it. Uh, but I think uh, it's very simple. I think if I need to uh, go back and just summarize, uh, the blood sugars, if you're using millimoles, uh, multiply by 18 to get milligrams. Divide by 115 in normal uh, situations, unstressful situations, uh, gives you uh, insulin requirement per hour. But if the patient is under stress, it becomes easy calculation. You just divide it by 100. So blood sugar in milligram per deciliter divided by 100 gives you insulin. Oral hypoglycemic, as long as patient is actually, uh, you know, eating, they can be on that. Uh, on the day of surgery, uh, some of the hypoglycemic agents can be continued. So GLP-1 uh, can be continued. Uh, the uh, metformin can be continued. Uh, but certain other drugs need to be at least stopped, like sulfonylureas and the, uh, uh, you know, incretin uh, analogs, they need to be uh, discontinued. 
Uh, but simply, a uh, simple thing is that if these patients who are on oral hypoglycemic, if they have to go on infusion, it's better to stop it. You can actually see very drastic uh, fall in blood sugar with start of insulin in this patient. And uh, my advice would be that if you are actually starting them on insulin, uh, monitor the blood sugar. The first uh, one hour, actually monitor the blood sugar at least two or three times uh, while starting the insulin. And uh, variable rate insulin infusion starting, it's very simple. One unit per ml of insulin in syringe. I started one ml per hour. Okay, and uh, if the insulin going up, just increase by one unit per hour, about uh, 12. If it is less than five, then you reduce to 0 0.5 ml per hour. So patients who are insulin dependent diabetics, they need to actually have this baseline, uh, you know, insulin running. So don't stop the insulin infusion. You can reduce to 0.5, give them blood, give them some uh, glucose to maintain the blood sugars, but do not, do not stop the insulin infusion in these patients. And when the patient go back to the ward, uh, uh, if they are getting going to get their subcutaneous insulin, uh, you need to continue the in insulin infusion for around 30 minutes. And you have clear instructions uh, how the hyperglycemia need to be managed. That's there in the part of the diabetic management. Uh, but for hyperglycemia, it's very, very important that there is clear instruction. You need to prescribe dextrose, right, with clear instruction that if the blood sugar is less than, you know, five, they need to have 100 ml of uh, this 20% dextrose. Uh, if it is around uh, six or, or, or around just about five, uh, between uh, six and five, then they need to just have 50 ml. They need to be hypoglycemia is bad. Okay, okay, fine. We know that hyperglycemia uh, can cause infection rate, but uh, having uh, in a long term or long duration of hyperglycemia is like, really bad. So need to have that. And then the Velo regimen for low resource center is actually a boon and it's a wonderful thing. You just need a bag of 5% dextrose and a pediatric burette. Uh, rinse the uh, burette uh, with the insulin 20 ml, so 5% dextrose, a little bit of insulin so that the insulin is absorbed onto the plastic and then fill up with 100 ml and then you use one unit uh, uh, of insulin for 100 ml. And according to the scale, which I actually have shown, which I will uh, put it up on the group, uh, you increase the insulin dose every hour. So it is labor, in, uh, sorry, labor intensive, uh, but a very, very simple uh, regimen. Thank you for watching this. And uh, we see you soon with another of the live lectures in a week or two time.